Fadi Amen Gafa. Welcome to the Salina to see the Marsh poetry reading. Um, Fast talking PI here at the Asian Pacific American Institute. Um, I'd like to begin tonight in acknowledgement of the Lenape Hoking, the, the land that's the traditional name of this land that we're standing on, uh, the land of the first people, the Lenape Lenape. Um, and I'd like to like to acknowledge the land and, and the people in in a way that is uh, familiar to the Pacific. Um, as we bring these specific vibes, these specific genealogies, these specific waves uh, here to this place that some people uh, acknowledge as New York City, New York University, um, um, and that is uh, with, a, um, with, a, with a blessing and a chant. So um, as I offer this blessing, I'll actually ask that you stand up um, in recognition of the ancestors that have come uh, to be with us today. children's song, and it's a, it talks about a hero named Kana, and uh, this is a story that's found, sprinkled throughout uh, Polynesia in different forms and under different names, but uh, in Hawaii, the hero is named Kana, and he was born in the form of a rope, and he was raised by uh, his grandmother Uli in Piho Nua, that's on Hawaii Island. And he um, was born in the form of a rope, and he kept growing, and he kept growing, and he kept growing. And they had to keep the, lengthening the house to accommodate him, to, mm -hmm. to the point where the house stretched from the mountain to the sea. <laughs> and he kept growing after that. Uh, he got engaged in a, a stretching contest. Uh, and uh, so he, his body became like a spider web, and he, he spread out all over Hawaii. Um, so that's one of the versions you find in Hawaii, um, and in, I'm, I'm seeing that in Samoa, there is a version where the hero uh, enters a cave and he goes to sleep, and while he's in the cave, he keeps growing, he keeps growing, getting longer and, and taller and more beautiful and strong. Um, <clears throat> so um, we chant this. Uh, in honor of your many ancestries. And um, I can't help but think of comparisons in the Western canon. And you think of uh, James Joyce, Ulysses, you have the father son relationship between uh, Stephen and Blue. You have um, in Homer, you have Telemachus <coughs> and Odysseus, they're searching out each other. And then you have finally in Shakespeare. Uh, Hamlet, you know, being dogged by the ghost of his father. Um, and I think the question is, uh, they saw this lasting manifestation of the self, and um, that's all well and good, but uh, what I think is special about Dr. Selena Marsh is that uh, she's a voice for women, uh, especially from the Pacific and in the post-colonial uh, uh, landscape where it's mostly dominated by, um, by male voices. So uh, then we hand it over and we welcome Dr. Selena Marsh. Tamofalava, Olavanaka, Maloi Lelei, Kiorana, Fakalofala, Hiatu, 
warm Pacific greetings to you all. I'd just like to say that small is beautiful. I gave one of my best readings to a room packed full of four people. One of those people happened to be the president of the Principals Association of New Zealand. Um, he then invited me back to perform in front of a thousand school principals in New Zealand. And through that tiny doorway, um, my work got introduced to the school curriculum. So I value <coughs> you making the time and the energy to be here with me tonight and, and to talk story a little bit. Um, my full name is Selina Tusitala Marsh, and Tusitala was my Tuvaluan grandfather's name. It means storyteller. And when a little-known writer called Robert Louis Stevenson lived his last years in Samoa in Apia, his work for um, local Samoans in achieving autonomy from a New Zealand colonial administration was acknowledged, as was his work in fiction, and they gave him the title Tusitala, or storyteller. So it's a legacy that I've grown up with, and Robert Louis Stevenson is kind of like the other side of the room for me. I tell very different stories. I'm of a very different demographic. Um, <clears throat> but we have the same um, view in mind, and that is autonomy and independence for indigenous peoples. Tusitala, teller of tales that I never heard till yesterday born away for another life today. The tale I tell is theirs and yours, a way of seeking some more of sa more of my sacred center. Today the tale I tell will book its way through tongued histories, sanctioned mysteries, spaces of silence, timeless lives. Tala Tusi, tell the book, word the spirit of brown, in theory and creativity we make our sound renown. <clears throat> I'm going to read a poem called New Zealand the Lucky Country. I was asked to take uh, part in a leaders debate, a national leaders debate, and the moot was Australia, the lucky country, because that's kind of a little bit of an adage between among Australians and New Zealanders. Australia is always seen as, you know, the blessed place where the jobs pay better and the houses are cheaper. <clears throat> so this was my response. New Zealand, the lucky country. Aotearoa, land of divine poetry, where Papa Tuanuku and Rangi, lovers of land, sky, and sea, progenitors of Māori, yes, New Zealand's a lucky country. Lucky the brothers were restless sons. Lucky they warred when dark had won. Lucky they longed for the light of the sun and the warmth of the open air. Lucky Tane was the heart-led son seeking bloodless revolution. Lucky he had the strength to stand and pry his parents apart. Lucky the lovers loved so much, missing the caress of each other's touch. For Rangi cries tears from the sky so freely, and Papa's fecken soil so healing, giving us Tane Mahuta's forests of jade green, rivers, lakes, underground springs, a green belt round this nation's hips, kissed all over by Moana's blue lips. From Te Waipaunamu to Te Ika a Maui, green stone to fishtail, lucky, lucky country. See the Pahutakawa blush deeply, along cliff edges rising steeply, where the dead depart for Hawaii. From Cape Rianga to Raki Uru Sea, yes, New Zealand's a lucky country. 
if you're not tangata whenua, your tangata teriti, whether British, South African or Somali, Chinese, Indian or Israeli, we've got the diversity, no ethnic cleansing policy. Well, <laughs> except for around 1833, that infected blanket strategy, Britain's manifest destiny taking land by any means necessary historical platform for Māori, fighting land wars, foreshores, bastion, pointing the way to all oh, blessed tiriti o waitangi, setting a fire in your belly against paternalistic tyranny. Just do it, said Sir T. Pene, and way before Nike. Yes, New Zealand's a lucky country. This land home to migrant tau iwi. From 1858 Wellington, Gujarati, to Al Wentz flying fox in a freedom tree. John Pule's tapa talk canvas 10 metres by 3, where 250,000 at Western Springs drink deep from the well. Hear them sing. Kiribati, Fijians, Tuvaluans, Samoans, Ni Vanuatu, Rotumans, Tongans, New Zealand borns, and the fusion from Nui to Scottish Highlanders makes Fijongans, Raramoans, and Pakeha Islanders. We had our Muldoon, but he was no Mugabe. We're fourth in the world with the least political conspiracy. We wear our sloganed t-shirts freely. In Queen Street, I see. Politicians are the same all over. They promise a bridge where there is no river. <laughs> and this one from Taupo down by the lake. In New Zealand, anyone can be prime minister. It's a risk you take. <coughs> New Zealand's a lucky country where our birthright civic duty lets you vote or not. It's free. There's no one purple finger vote, no machete held at your family's throat, no AK-40 per seven to persuade you at the polls, no standing in the dust waving the same flag as the presidential rolls. New Zealand's a lucky country where inconvenient geography, no landlocked topography, we're far but close enough to see. Our dairy economy makes the milk in this land of honey. Kiwi Shakespeare sharing, farming, families, gum boot brigading, black singlet parading, number eight wire mentality in enterprise and industry. It's Fred Dagg haggling in the city. It's a land of opportunity, hard work meeting synchronicity, where we can still think differently. Because we're Te Moana Nui Akiwa's Kiwis, Tōtara Waka Park next to Chromed Humvee, next to Vespa, next to Uncle's souped up taxi, where beaching beauty is for free. Reservations of canvas, teepees, jandals flip-flopping, Rachel Hunter, Hunter tip-topping, bare feet lapping the sea under how holy ozone CV. Yes, New Zealand's a lucky country. When our great nation's greatest anomaly is the freedom to be or not to be, to be nouveau culture or customary, to walk with burqa or face and hair free. New Zealand's a lucky country, but like Sir Tipene and Sir Paul Reeves, we've got to horizon seek. Otherwise, it's good night, Kiwi, and everything we think is free lies hostage to a world economy. We need intergenerationality, eco-sustainability for our fossil fuels and energy in this land of space, water and sea. We need a bit of Sir Ed Hillary, who had the same fear of heights as you and me, but not the bastard off anyway. Yes, New Zealand's a lucky, 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 lucky country. Thank you.
lots of New Zealand specific references there, but um, I know a couple of you are nodding, so <laughs> that's good. Um, in my collection Fast Talk, the Fast Talking P, I, I've got a, a talk back section, so I'll just read you a few poems from that section and hopefully you'll be um, aware of the references. But if you're not, Vasco Balboa was the first Spanish Euro explorer to enter the Pacific. Um, Gauguin was a French painter whose images, well everyone knows Paul Gauguin, right? You've got the Met right here. Okay. This poem's called Guys Like Gauguin. <laughs> Thanks, Bougainville, for desiring them young. So guys like Gauguin could dream and dream, then take his syphilitic body downstream to the tropics to test his artistic hypothesis about how the young ripen like pawpaw, a best slightly raw, delectably firm, seeding nymphomania for guys like Gauguin. <laughs> hey, thanks, Balboa, for crossing the Isthmus of Panama in 1513 and pronouncing our ocean the South Seas. Hey, thanks, Vasco, for making us your underbelly, the occidental opposite of all your nightmares, your waking dream, inversion of all your laws, your darkest fantasies. Thanks for seeing the earth as a body, the north its head, full of rationality, reason, seasons of meaning, cultivated gardens of consciousness grown in masculine, orderly fashion, a high evolution towards the light. Thanks for making the self an erogenous zone, corporeal and sexual, emotive and natural, waiting in the shadows of dark feminine instinct populated by the Africus, the Orient, the Americus, and now us. <laughs> Two nudes on a Tahitian beach, 1894. <laughs> Go gone. <laughs> you piss me off. You strip me bare ass. Turn me on my side, shove a fan in my hand, smearing fingers on thigh, pout my lips below an almond eye and silhouette me in smouldering ochre. And I move just a little in this putrid breeze, hair heavy to fuchsia's knees still. I'm the pulse on the arm of this wall, and I've drawn her to me again. Here she comes, not liking that she likes me, not liking you, but knowing that she likes me, not liking you, liking me, but she likes me and sees me, but not you, because you, Gauguin, Piss us off. <laughs> okay. um, this, I wanted to, I always try and share a fresh work. Um, and so I'll, I'll share this fresh work and then I'll finish off with my chant poem. So this is quite a new poem, it's called Apostles, and um, last year I had the tremendous honour of interviewing Alice Walker for our Auckland Writers Festival on stage, and so getting to know her during that time um, <clears throat> was wonderful. So Cushion in the Middle of the Road refers to her latest book about how she tried to retire from revolutionary activity and then just ended up bringing a cushion with her and placing it in the middle of the road because the revolutionary activity was just always around. Apostles. Alice Walker said before placing a red cushion in the middle of the road, 
that poetry was revolutionary. Sometimes I don't believe her, even though I'm writing about Pacific apostles, 12 disciples of the word, the first 12 women poets, mostly as yet unheard. They are lava, they are mother, they are uros and eros, they are flying fish out of water. See, I was googling betel nut, PNG, mild narcotic, like kava wrapped in daga leaf, the nut is chewed with crushed coral and shell. Well, that makes lime, alters pH levels in your mouth turning saliva blood red, hence the blood-like splotches on Port Moresby's streets, bins, seats, windows, benches, signs, cars, shop front ledges. Before the total ban in January this year, I'm not a chewer myself, but my husband tried it. A Solomon Island student offered it to him, a sign of hospitality, of friendship, beer and betel nuts for them all, even his teeth pinking after chewing, chewing. And I was googling about the acid in the mouth and oral cancers and ulcers. And I was googling about the lime and burning. And up comes a photo. A brown woman, her back bare, is sitting on a corrugated iron dock, noose round her neck, wrists bound, flecks of machete bites mar her back, one gash so deep its creviced meat has discoloured in the smoking air. I cannot see her face, but the encircling crowd can. Three-year-old boy leaning on the young man can. Little girl in red polka dot skirt holding father's hand can. Gang of youths stoke the irons in the open tin barrel. I cannot see her face. But sister, held back by the policeman can. Policeman held back by the mob can. Fire truck driver blocked by the mob can too. Her shoulders have lost their angular protest, hang askew. Her skin is silent and waiting. The behaviour of a witch, if ever they saw one, the highland bush sings. The trial begins. Blogs tell me many tried to stop the staking, the poker burning. I am told her 70-year-old mother struggled to free her. They broke her pelvis, her femur. Sister cannot comprehend how both crawled their way through dirt and mob to church back door step, flesh, flesh burning between her legs, soldered by soldiers against sorcery. Mother and daughter taken into custody for their own protection. Police made attackers sign a promissory note to leave them alone. Sister never sees them again. But there is no doubt as to the whereabouts of 20-year-old mother of two Kepari Lineata, blamed for the unexplained death of a six-year-old boy, dragged from her hut Strung up like a pig, she bore the dance of knives and burning rods for hours before being staked on an unholy altar. Piles of used huggies, nappies, Marengo miscellanea and tyres stained red by spit, then lit. The mob were more sophisticated, mining, money, orientated, Armed with curiosity, cell phones and steady hands, posted pics on Instagram. Not in the 40s in Jackson's Lottery, but in February 2013. Alice, how could a poem possibly revolutionise 
Que pare lineata, que pare lineata, que pare lineata, que pare lineata. So I'll finish off with my um, identity chart, and um, I sent Dean Saranello um, a link to an article I'd written about the genesis of Fast Talking PI, and I was inspired by one of your own poets from this place, from New York, um, Anne Waldman, who was in turn inspired by Maria Sabina, her chants and her prayers. So uh, this is taken off, it's been unbelievable how um, especially school kids have taken the poem on board and um, I'm all about poem being a doorway, a gateway, a window, being able, uh, allowing people to access that thing that they have come to fear, a poem. So um, kids have taken this on board, they've created their own versions, it's been quite wonderful. So it's called Fast Talking PI, and for non-New Zealand or Pacific versions, I start off with um, two lines, for your sake. <laughs> Not Magnum PI, Pacific Islander PI. I'm a fast talking PI, I'm a power walking PI, I'm a demographic, hieroglyphic, fact sheet welding PI, I'm a theorizing PI, I'm a strategizing PI, I'm published in a peer reviewed journal PI, I'm a slot machine PI, I'm a lotto queen PI, I'm a tote ticket church bingo TAB PI, I'm a vegan PI, I'm a rainbow warrior PI, I'm a protest sign against the rising waters PI. I'm a criminal PI behind the bar graphs PI. I'm a gun smoking patch totem king cobra PI. I'm a fale PI. I'm a marae PI. I'm a living breathing dwelling of my ancestors PI. I'm a lazy PI. I'm a pee crazy PI. I'm a hard drinking hard speaking where my ex PI. I'm a land based PI. A fanua PI. I'm a village is the centre of my world, P.I. I'm a harvesting, P.I. Copper sacking, P.I. I'm a biting beef cause no more fish in reef, P.I. I'm a diabetic, P.I. I'm a heart disease, P.I. I'm a gout inflated, incubated case study, P.I. I'm a Siva Samo, P.I. I'm an Ava pouring, P.I. I'm a Tula Fale tonguing genealogy, P.I. I'm an independent, P.I. I'm a flag raising PI. I'm a fa'a love, love, loving, given, living PI. I'm a standing PI. I'm a beehive PI. I'm a labor MP, gonna be PM one day PI. I'm a quiet PI. I'm a small PI. I'm a take no lunch to school today, but anyway PI. I'm an all black PI. I'm an all white PI. I'm a gold, silver, bronze, blue street signed PI. I'm an angry PI, I'm a dawn raided PI, I'm a crouching poly panther in grey lin PI, I'm a shark tooth PI, I'm a tato PI, I'm a malu and a better flying fox let loose PI. I know how to be in this world, I know how to feed in its waters, I know how to read the stars and the seabirds, I know how to live off poetry. I know how to give it away. I'm a property PI, a self-employed PI. I'm a mocker drinking homeroom glass and real TV PI. I'm a moving PI. I'm a grooving PI. I'm a Nisian mystic stratospheric whooping it PI. I'm a crumpin PI, a go for God PI. I'm a color free gangster wannabe for the Lord PI. I'm a BA PI. I'm an MA PI. I'm a PhD become LLB MD PI. 
P-I. I'm a bi P-I. I'm a gay P-I. I'm a cross-gendered, soul-blended, mascaraed P-I. I'm a coloured P-I. I'm a canvas P-I. An acrylic oil PVC 4x2 P-I. I'm a bit of both P-I. A chameleon P-I. A hybrid mongrelized, self-satisfied P-I. I'm a shadowing P-I. I'm a fathoming P-I. I'm an ocean. I'm the wave. I'm the depths of it P-I. I'm a territorial P-I. I'm a pure blood P-I. I'm a border language stop, do not pass, go P-I. I'm a freezing works P-I. I'm an IT P-I. I'm a sewing, stuffing, soaking, shaking, stirring P-I. I'm a talanoa P-I. I'm a tava P-I. I'm the space, the time, the tune, the transcending P-I. I'm a pair of Jimmy Choo's. I'm a size 13 and fuchsia, please. I'm a no shoe fits the foot of an earth mama. I'm a royal P.I. I'm a commoner P.I. I'm a coup supported you and you and you deported P.I. I'm a white Sunday P.I. An LMS P.I. I'm a born again no mandatory tithing P.I. I'm Tihe, that first born breath. I'm that pulsating cord. I'm that breaking water. I'm that loose knot threatening to tighten. I'm a lover, P.I. I'm a mama, P.I. I'm a breastfeed till they tell you I'm done now. Thanks very much, Mum. <laughs> I'm a Nafanur, P.I. I'm a warrior, P.I. I'm the breast kept secret in ancient Samoan warfare, P.I. I'm a dub dub dub, P.I. I'm a Bebo, P.I. I'm a good looking face booking, hooking up, P.I. I'm a melting pot, P.I. An homogenous, P.I. I'm a skim milk, green top, fat free, heterogeneous, P.I. I'm a Denny's, P.I. I'm a sour D's, P.I. I'm a finger licking, KFC, MDB, KPI. I'm a Vaka P.I. I'm a star charting P.I. I'm navigating by Nissan Navara P.I. I'm a red lipstick P.I. I'm a big hair P.I. A multicolored silhouetted Fafa Fine P.I. I'm a crying P.I. I'm a laugh too loud P.I. I'm a Mike Jandal your mouth Derek Wannabe P.I. I'm a long poem P.I. <laughs> I'm a long song P.I. I'm a smooth crooner, softly lullabying P.I. I'm a theorizing slot machine, bloodless coo, Jimmy Choo's, love a blood clot, melting pot, shark tooth, brothers let loose, white Sunday, lippy B.A. I'm a fast talking P.I. Fafatai tele lover, thank you. And thank you to the indigenous people of this place, the Lanape Hawking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Selena, for, um, for coming all this way and for bringing your poetry. Um, and it's kind of funny that you share that piece last because that was actually the first piece that I heard from you um, in my first Pacific Literature course when I took it at the University of Guahan. Um, and I had, um, oh, thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, I never heard about that um, piece as a chant. And so I'm interested in this kind of, because um, you know when we when we as indigenous people or as specific people talk about chant and um, and you know in the, these kind of like cultural activities, um, it tends to have a very specific genealogy. Um, but you are you're talking about it in this genealogy also of poetry. Um, and so I'm interested if you can kind of talk about how that informed the work and what um, yeah and how that informed your creation of the piece, but also um, your perpe perpe the piece in perpetuity. Um. You're just so articulate for someone so young. Um, <laughs> you should have heard our lunch conversation. So you're talking, you're asking about aesthetics. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you for your beautiful chant. Aloha. Thank you. Mahalo. Um, so you're asking about the aesthetics of the piece, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the context of the piece. So. Um, a few years ago, um, I had woken up one morning and opened up the national newspaper. Well, actually on the front cover, there was this really inflammatory headline that said, PIs, brown underclass of New Zealand, uh, sucking the economy, draining the, a drain on the economy. 
And um, that was just kind of like the last proverbial straw because I had, there were, had been media coverage stereotyping Pacific Islanders as one homogenous brown amorphic group and the, the article was ill-informed yet splashed on you know, ma making national headlines and so I thought we are much more than that and I wanted to begin piecing together an identity chant and claiming more parts of the PI community than were you know, uh, Im immediately obvious to outsiders. So um, I began this kind of like reclaiming chant, which also claimed the bad stuff. I mean, everybody's got, every people, every nation, every race has the bad stuff and mixing it in with the good stuff. Um, because in my family, we had been the blue collar workers. We'd been the labor workers since the 50s. We'd worked shift work. None of us were ever wealthy dependent. And that, my story was in, in that headline. And that headline would grab people's attention. So the choice of turning it into a, ch a chant was both genealogical because um, singing, dancing, chanting, that's the literature, you know, our, we have the thousand year plus tradition of oral literature, so it is the rhythm in the body that um, is a mode of communication in and of itself. But also it's like, I just, I'm a teacher as well at university and, and kids tended not to like poetry. They had been schooled out of, of liking poetry. They felt that it was an inaccessible form and they felt dumb every time they read it because they couldn't access it. And so my response to that was, well, let's, everybody can click their finger, well, almost everybody. <laughs> everybody can click their fingers, right? And so it becomes this gateway and I've, I've run hundreds of workshops where people have sat around and said, poetry's got nothing to do with me. And I said, okay, well, but does this have something to do with you? Yeah. And then does your name have something to do with you? Yeah. Well, let's put it in the rhythm. And does where you live have something to do with you and your grandfather's name and your, you know, and slowly it would build up this chant. Yeah. And I've been called a hip hop rap kind of person. I'm too square to be that. <laughs> Like I'm a, a nerd at heart, and so that, that doesn't sit well with me, neither does kind of spoken word um, poet. Um, what, what I've come to see as quite an empowering thing is when you can actually just sit in an aesthetic space and claim it as yours, even if nobody quite sounds like you. So, you know, um, I'm a performance poet, kinda, kinda spoken word, but I, I, I do love the paper. And I, I love reading off the paper, but I also like to kind of sing, chant the meaning. I, what I really love about your, um, about your, your engagement with poetry is um, we were just having lunch um, right before this. I um, have bison for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so speaking of what New York can offer to you, <laughs> bison, um, <laughs> I just, I, what I was thinking about over lunch is kind of what you had talked about planting a poem in the earth um, and then going back to it, right? Um, and so I'm kind of wondering if you might want to share a little bit about that, um, the different processes that you have in thinking about poetry. Like clearly there's the very political way that it enters into your conversation reading a newspaper, um, you know, but then there's this genealogical level, right? Um, this connection to the, um, to the earth. And so I would maybe have some um, poetic processes that you want to talk about um, and share. Another really great question. So I'm a big believer in synchronicity, um, and I'm a follower of Julia Cameron, who lives right here in New York. I think I'll stalk her next week. Um, <laughs> the artist way. So she's a big believer in synchronicity. And um, in December, I was invited to a conference in Taiwan, and in February, I was invited to the, uh, a festival there. And so I thought, wow, I'm going to be in the same place with an eight-week gap. What can I do um, to have people access poetry in a different way? And how do I translate this new environment that I'm in? So I thought, of course, I will bury a poem. <laughs> so I took the, um, a couplet from an indigenous Atayao poet. There are, the government officially recognizes 16 indigenous tribes in Taiwan. I took his couplet and I took a couplet of my own. I cut up our words and I buried them 
in the tai, uh, Taipei Memorial Park called the 228 Park, where 228 uh, people died under um, Chinese rule, and now it's memorialized. So I thought, this is a land, this is a space. Uh, one of my poems talked, the very first poem, Tusi Tala, talked about sanctioned violence, spaces of silence, timeless lives. And so I wanted to bury our words there to see what the land would return to me. So the land, but like literally cutting up the words, digging a hole under a tree and covering it with soil and returning eight weeks later to see what words would be left. And so um, the bizarre idea got out and the Taiwan, Taiwanese media were really interested and the New Zealand media were really interested. So I had a little gang with me go back eight, eight weeks later and I dug up the poem. And um, all that I was left word, what was, with, was the word ing. And so all the cameras were on me and I dig up and they said, what did you find? And I went, I found ing. <laughs> <laughs> and the New Zealand journalist said, oh, you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, no, because the next step, okay, so I was left with ing. So the next step in this poetry experiment, you are talking about process, was the very next word that I found ing in would be the beginning of my poem. So we walked all around the park, could not find an ing word. And so I thought, I've got to go next door to the museum and uh, pick up my son's toy or something. So I was going through the museum exhibition, massive exhibition on jade, which is a precious material there. The first letter, like seven feet by seven feet, was Jing Shi. Jing Shi. And I was like, oh, what does that mean? That's, that's the word that begins the poem. Jing Shi is the element for which jade is treasured. It means life force and energy. And so it was like, wow, the land had returned to me. Probably the most profound word that I could have ever had and when I presented it back to the Taiwanese Literary Festival, the people, as I was talking the mic, people were gathering around and just packing it in and heaps of youth. And when it came to question time, the youth were like really enthusiastic and they said, Ing, Ing is now in our popular speak. So the present continuous English word Ing is now in Taiwanese youth speak for indicating present continuous. So someone will go, how's your love life going? They'll go, ing. It's going. <laughs> it's yeah. going, it's wow. going. It's, it's, wow. But they'll say ing or they'll say ing. Wow. And the number one um, K-pop song at that time yeah. was called Love ING. So like it spoke to all ages. It was, it was quite an incredible um, moment. So here, the first place I visited was Inwood Hill and I came across a memorial stone where, or you, you explained it really well, but where uh, the first exchange was made by... Hen Henry Hudson. Henry Hudson. And, and the, the first people. The yeah. first people of this land. And um, I couldn't find any other information, so I thought this is where the land needs to speak back to me. So I buried the same words at the foot of that memorial rock, and I'll go back in five days it would have been two weeks, and I'll go back in five days to see what the land has to say. But, what, but what's, like, more than just kind of being experimental or abstract, it provides a point of interest and curiosity for people who, if they kind of think, oh, it's a poem, it's got nothing to do with me, but, oh, what's she doing? She's burying it and then yeah. digging it up. What for? Why? Yeah. So it's a, it's a mode of communication, if you like, without being you know, beaten over the head with politics. Or well, they don't know they are until the last minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the Aotearoa coming out in you. <laughs> Beating somebody over the head. <laughs> um, well, rocks are also important in Samoan right. culture too. Dwayne Johnson, yeah. <laughs> um, <It's> my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about your work with young people and just yeah about I mean I was interested when you said that you were invited back um, to the principals association and um, you know your work is integrated into the curriculum but then also that young people were kind of um, like taking up the your PI poem your fast talking PI poem um, and and then you know the young people again um, at the festival at the in Taiwan right 
Um, and so I just, I guess I'm interested in, um, you know, you're saying that young people don't really engage with poetry, um, and yet you're finding ways to do it. Um, and so, yeah, I was wondering if you can just kind of talk about um, your relationship with young folks in the like poetry realm. Um, I know that you also ha have some children too, um, which yeah, they, they don't read poetry. Oh, <laughs> they're boys. <laughs> <laughs> My challenge is to mm -hmm. to 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 make a poem um, that they will read, and uh, but you know it got quite serious because they're 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 sixteen, fourteen, and twelve, and you'd think they grew up in a cardboard box with no books. And I lecture at Auckland University, you know, and I thought there has I've got to change. I've got to try and reach them. So I sat them around the table and I said, "Who has to write a poem that you to make you want to read it?" And they mentioned all these elite athletes. So I'm currently trying to work with some of the elite Māori Pacific athletes. Like I don't know if you know, you probably don't know all the kind of New Zealand rugby players and rugby league players, and um, to see if they will write a poem to encourage this. That you know, this demographic, like brown boys, very few of them read poetry. I mean, I could say that for a lot of kids generally, but specifically these boys. And so it's it's again out of a need to try and reach them where they are. Rhythm is where youth are, right? Rhythm, dancing, movement. That's where they are because it's a universal language. And what what was really interesting to me for fast talking PRs, I would get them. I'd give them. I'd say, you know, you can replace, if you're not a Pacific Islander or you don't want the acronym PI, put your own initials in. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because school after school after school, the PI kids would use their own name initials. The Pakia kids, the white kids wanted PI. <laughs> it's like, really? Yes. Yeah, can we be Pacific Islanders? And I said, well, you live in a Pacific Island nation. Right. You know, so right. yes, of course you can. So, you know, it was also allowing them to enter into a world that they kind of thought, oh, that's got nothing to do with me. I'm so, this, I'm all of a sudden I perked up because now you're driving into the realm of politics of who can identify and, you know, who can identify with, with what. Um, but, you know, but also coming from Aotearoa, we were talking over lunch about the Treaty of Waitangi and kind of the different political relationships that mm -hmm. um, New Zealand has between the indigenous people and, um, and the other people who are all have made New Zealand their home. Um, and I'm interested if y your perspective coming from New Zealand and, um, you know, clearly you're looking up to Alice Walker and kind of seeing this generation of poetry as revolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, inter I'm interested in what your, um, what your perspective might be about um, the poetics of revolution here in the United States coming from Aotearoa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what are you drawn to um, from here, and what is it that speaks to the experience of being Samoan, uh, Tuvaluan, um, and in Pakia um, that speaks kind of across the ocean to you, and how did and how does that resonate? Yeah, I think um, as an example, I'll use when I first I went into the Penn Sound, the University of Pennsylvania. They, they've got a Penn Sound audio, massive audio library of these incredible poets. And when I clicked on Anne Waldman's Far Speaking Woman, I'd never heard anything like it. It was like a rant, a 14 minute rant. And when I uh, found a YouTube clip of, clip of her reading it, it was almost like she was in a trance. And that, that, that poem has lasted for decades and decades. And I became really interested in aesthetics that cross, like culturally cross over. And she in turn had been good friends with Jerome Rothenberg, who had been friends with Maria Sabina, um, who he found in Mexico, and um, an ethnographer who started, you know, a, well, he, he was a poet and a kind of ethno creative eth ethnographer, started putting down her chants and her prayers on the page, which suddenly changed how people access them. So, um, I, firstly, I, I loved her rant, and when I heard it, I thought, what if feminism was not at the heart of this poem but cultural identity? What, what would it look like then? How would it change the internal politics of it? You know, um, And what I liked about Anne Waldman was that she was na trying to name every single kind of woman, you know, and in doing so, being inclusive, um, and that aligns with my own politics. So that poem, New Zealand, The Lucky Country, I'm not Māori, I'm not tangata whenua, but we have the Treaty of Waitangi, which the British Crown 
and certain representatives of Māori tribes signed in 1848, I think, um, which shared sovereignty over the, the, the nation. So I'm not Māori, I'm therefore tangata te riti. Everyone else is there by virtue or under that treaty. And being at that land, I thought, and have, a, have been invited to share in the stories of that land. So everyone gets to share in those stories of that land. But as you heard in the poem, there's a, there's a wonderful beauty about being able to share, but also there's an accountability to own that history as well. No ethnic, you know, uh, that, that, that line where I, where I talk about, well, except for that inflected blanket strategy, Britain's manifest destiny, right? It's acknowledging the colonial history and embracing what is ours under the treaty as well. Yeah. I don't know, did I answer your question? I think so, I think so. Did she answer the question? I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I, I really don't want to pretend that it's just us two on this fancy stage um, <laughs> and everyone else is just watching the continuation of our lunch. <laughs> My bison burger was bleeding. I loved it. <laughs> it was so funny. I was like, so we have two options. We're going to either go to the Indonesian restaurant or a burger place. And at first she was like, you know, whatever. And then I was like, the burger place is really fancy. There's elk and there's a bison. And she goes... What? <laughs> and like that's where we're going. Um, so. Except I was halfway through the bison burger and I said to him, "Are bison still endangered?" Here's <laughs> 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 oh, they're farmed. I mean, oh. <laughs> um, so yeah, you first ask later. <laughs> <laughs> At least halfway through. Um, so yeah, you've you've left us with so much, and I'm sure that some people have some reactions or questions uh, that we'd like to throw into the the pot. I'm not scary. <laughs> I'm not scary, P.I. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens. That is exactly what happens. And I've had people come up and say, oh, you left out the sleeping under the bridge, P.I. So I said, well, go and make your own one and, and send it to me and I'll add it to, you know. And it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And the last major project I was involved with was uh, with Somali, Somali refugee youth. And I worked with them, and we came up with Fast Talking Airs, Fast Talking African Somalis, mm -hmm. and it's part of the Te Papa exhibition running for three years now. So they produced their own wow. chant I, in, in terms of helping them belong to their new home of New Zealand. Sorry, Yadi. What if you can share your, an experience where um, someone shared with you their understanding of your poem? that kind of really just stood out, you know, and you mm. share. Mm. You know, I was, um, I was invited to the Ukraine Literary Festival and we um, began collaborating a translated collection of poems and we stayed up from, we started at two in the afternoon and we went right through to two the next morning translating the, um, uh, this book. Um, be, the, but the poem that we could not translate was Fast Talking P.I. We took like three hours uh, and the translator's uncle kept coming by and dropping off some Samo Honka, which is homemade vodka. <laughs> so we, after we finished the verse, we all right. <laughs> um, but he, it was really, it, we couldn't translate it into Ukrainian setting. It was, it was really bizarre because the translator said, he wanted to, but it was the barriers were, were, were too hard. Yet the Tusitala poem, he could translate, like he translated that so fast. I'm not, and it's always kind of puzzled me why we couldn't quite get there. And he said he'd have to make his own, completely his own version. So that was the challenge that I, that I left with him. I said, take it. Different rhythms, everything. It was, it was just too hard to, you know. He just even, even that rhythm. He's like all out of beat, and I was like, stop, stop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but so, so, so the collection that came out was called Tusitala, with selected poems, but without the fast-talking PI. So that's probably the, the thing, because it was never quite resolved. Yeah. yeah. So he never took you up on the challenge? Um, he's still working on it. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's a poet himself. Yeah, Croc Publications, yeah. And what's his name? Um, Yuri. Yuri. 
Svetlana. Beautiful. I'm interested in that, um, that fresh work that you generously shared with us. Uh, you used the new word, I think it's only a year old, the verb Googling, <laughs> and the way that it transferred you from one thought, one intention that you had to another. <laughs> And I was wondering if, as a, a poet and educator, as a mother, if you could speak to how the internet and internet surfing might be changing our stream of consciousness and how we go from one thought or one image to another, and also if that has affected New Zealand and its sense of isolation, having the internet. Mm -hmm. So we, we meander the paths that we find ourselves walking on rather than trying to stick to a linear kind of journey. So I think that that's, that's what happened um, with the Google searching, and um, I don't. I think only in the physical sense do New Zealanders feel kind of so far away. Like when we've got to take an eleven-hour flight and then a six and a half-hour flight just to get here, you know, in LA airport. They warned me, but far out, you know. <laughs> um, in the physical sense, but like online, it's just all the doors have come crashing down. And a student of mine now heads the flexible and long distance learning unit at the University of the South Pacific in Suva, Fiji. She um, caters to 28,000 students around the Pacific through Moodle, through on le online learning programs. And they all have satellite classrooms. And I sat there and one person would lecture to thousands of students all around the Pacific who would come to community centers or on campus to learn and to ask questions back in real time. So it's, it's, it's mind boggling, it's mind boggling. But as a poet, it's those sideways, it's those back alleys, those side pathways where the richest poetic material can be found. You know, because you, you start off with one intention and you arrive in Hoboken. <laughs> flat on my face, uh, flat on my face after falling over. Hmm? Oh. Hmm. oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so um, as a mother, <laughs> I mean, the biggest difference I notice is that, say, family time, like we'll sit down and watch a movie, and every, they can't seem to be able to not have the device in their hands. So now we have a carver bowl, everyone has to deposit their phones or their electronic devices, even mum and dad, shame to say and then we can sit down and have a movie. But it's difficult, they get ants in their pants and they just they want to check stuff and, you know. But at the same time, we're able to check follow-up references in the movie, like, oh, what's that? So, oh, I'll see, I'll get it, oh, I'll research that. Oh, it's this, this, you know, so it's, yeah, it's mind-boggling. Mm. But really good for a poetic process. Yeah, yeah. Same yeah. So I, I teach at NYU. My name is Dean. Congratulations on the new thank baby. You, yeah. you know, now they're going to have holo holographic um, cell phones by the time baby. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right um, and you know, I have been doing some reading around, like so. Vince Diaz has a lot of work around voyaging, um, and a lot of the things that he's been talking about are the ways in which voyaging itself, the seafaring canoes, can be used in order to open up these, these lands that are heavily settler colonized, right? So I mean, I think like, um, having lived here for three years, I can definitely tell that, you know, this is a place where indigeneity is just kind of absent from people's minds. Land-based practices are sort of absent. It's kind of imagined as this heavily modern place, which is sort of, sort of antithetical to the indigenous. And even at NYU, we don't have a Native American studies program, we have an indigenous studies program. And um, Glenn Coulter has that one term, he calls it urban nullius, kind of like a playing off of terra nullius. Yeah. Yeah. It, but it, it's a sort of way in which indigenous is so, so invisible from here. See, see, in, in Auckland they've got urbanesia, okay. because yeah. we're so pop, you know, PI heavy in the city. Yeah, yeah but quite a different. Yeah. And it seems like the Pacific is now, I mean, I'm thinking about Mauna Kea and how international that movement has become, how much support people are lending to it. Next year, the Hokulea and Hikiamalia, are going to be here um, in 2016. Your presence here, I'm just wondering, and the work that you're doing in terms of just kind of doing a, a practice of remembering the people who are from here and engaging with it in a contemporary way, right? In a way that makes it alive. And I guess, I don't really know how to, how to ask this question, but I guess in terms of the, the previous dialogue that you just had about diaspora 
and you write about the Pacific diaspora, and I'm just kind of wondering um, how you see the Pacific and, and a lot of these global issues, whether it's climate change and sea level rising and those kind of things, its role in, in global politics today, its, its role in an important um, intervention, I'm not sure if interventions, but huli is the word I think, I think in Hawaii, is like to write correctly, and it, it's, I mean, I think of the hokulea being here, it's very different from how Henry Hudson came in here, right? It's a very different project. It's a, it's a project that's attempting to allow indigenous peoples to succeed in their movements for sovereignty and territory and those kinds of things. And I guess it just seems like it, your poetry is, has so much movement in there. There's so much that you're heterogeneity in there. And it's not contending with an indigeneity of the past, but it's, you know, I guess, I don't really know how to explain yeah. that. The global politics of the Pacific it just seems to be so relevant to things right now, at the same time that it's in many ways sometimes dismissed. Yeah, I think that's why um, art plays a vital role. It is kind of, you know, one of the main veins for connection and relationality in a way that politics um, might not be able to practice. So, you know, I've been listening to people who have been here for the UN for Indigenous Peoples um, meeting and the sense of frustration that very little has changed. In fact, in some ways, three decades on, it's, it's worse. Um, but in the arts, I, I, there's a different spirit. There's a spirit of embracing and energy and overcoming. And in my, um, in my international travels, um, I have found people to be wanting to help but not know how to, not know how to access. And so um, the BBC recently did a postcards um, series of videos and readings um, related to the London Olympics in 2012 and I was part of that. And what struck me was the spirit of like, we, we want to help you get your message out, just use us as a medium. It's got to be within this paradigm, but that we're doing, that that's what we've got to work with. So are you willing to, you know, so I'm always saying to artists, get out there, even if it's a toe in the door, just get out there. There are lots and lots and lots of well-meaning people. Um, and art, art can kind of go like this, you know, where, where the door would be closed on something overtly political, through a poem, through a song, through a dance, through a painting, you can do lots of other stuff too. But, e but even before that, I think, you know, to, to go back to youth and the issue of identity, um, we were talking about in the diaspora the sense of there's a lot of the literature coming up that is still lamenting a lack of cultural authenticity in the diaspora, like not being brown enough or being, you know, white on the outside, brown on the inside, vice versa, whatever it is, you know, and there's still this... Um, for me, one of my passions is is enabling those people, you know, where I once was, to feel absolutely authentic exactly where they are. You know, that they're good enough as they are, that their voice is valid and contributes to the overall scene of things, um, despite the degree of cultural authenticity that they feel that they have access to or not, you know. Um, and an example of that kind of turning around is the use of the term afakasi, or half-caste in Samoan language. So my mentor, Albert Went, who is proclaimed as the forefather of Pacific literature, hates that word. For him, he, you know, the context of that word is racist. It was imposed by Germans and Samoans who wanted to quantify people's ethnicity to control their access to education and to money and, and business. And that's fair enough, but that word just won't die in the diaspora because it describes and gives permission to own both sides, white and Samoan, or a multitude of bloodlines, you know. And so we have this ongoing argument that it won't die because it's still relevant to people's lives. And until another turn comes up, that enables people to feel authentic as they are, who they are, and that's when they can do fascinating work that's when they can do the real work, when it's coming from an authentic place rather than a projected islandness, Pacific islandness, or wh whatever it is. 
And I think that's what people see in fast talking PI is that, oh, you can be this and this and this and this and still claim that identity label. So in Hawaii, we, and, you know, I'm not Kanaka Maoli, and I do a lot of work around settler colonialism, and it's a heavy topic, and um, I see it as a, a set of politics that allows for self-critique at the same time that we're understanding we are also sort of exploited within the same similar structure, but not equatable structure, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a means of solidarity to, to Kanaka Maoli. Yeah. But it also necessitates a lot of self-critique because yes. of the amount of history that took place in terms of achieving statehood, in terms of achieving development, and all in sacred lands, and et cetera. And I guess I was just kind of curious how the Pacific diaspora deals with this in Aotearoa. Like how, did, how, you know, because it's, it's, and when I try to teach it, a lot of people get hung up on the word settler, and I'm never after people trying to identify as settler, so much as I'm after the critique of settler colonialism. Yes. At a, with a simultaneous understanding of all these other formations of exploitation and, and oppression. And I think just hearing what you just said about identities and trying to figure out an identity that people can tap into, um, I'm just kind of curious if, if there, like, there are works that are being done that I might be able to read um, in terms of how to articulate that message of critique in a loving way, in a way that is also about community building. And so I guess. It's a certain kind of challenge in terms of just even teaching here. I, I taught a little bit about um, Sandy Grandy's critique of the Occupy Wall Street movement from an indigenous perspective here in terms of that word occupation. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was, a, it was a good class, it was a productive class, but I could tell it was an uncomfortable. And discomfort is a space of learning, so I'm not afraid of discomfort, but I guess how do you tap into that space of trying to direct people's energies to being supportive of of decolonization to be supportive in a way that's you know taking people seriously and not uh, not talking down to these bodies. Yeah, it, and it all depends on how those conversations are set up, because if you're placed in a position where you're competing for resources, mm -hmm. as in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, Maldives and Pacific Islanders were competing for government resources, and so of course. There was a lot of animosity between those groups. You know, they each had their arguments. Māori needed to be acknowledged as tangata whenua and separate, different from migrant groups. Migrant groups were, you know, there from the 50s, well, 1848, the, well the Gujarati, the Indians in Wellington, you know. So everybody had their kind of unique claims. So it depends on, you know, where, so in the 80s and 90s when Māori started to be officially recognised, as having a distinct separate status. I felt like the competition started being alleviated as we also intermarried. I've got three half, half Māori brothers. You know, it's kind of like Fano, Ainga kind of starts taking over as well. But um, there are certain parallels, like, like Milani Anai and Eve Coxon put together a, um, a research methodology, methodologies paper for Pacific Health, but a lot of people incorporate their principles for or guidelines for research when you're dealing with indigenous and ethnic communities and you know the five top principles for research are the first one is alofa or love the second one is service reciprocity you know it was like people it completely blew people's minds and it came under a lot of fire because like who undertakes research with love Huh? You know, so kind of shifting those paradigms was needed as well, but it was something that Māori and Pacific came together on, stood together on, yeah. And at, at the space at Auckland University, after the Whare Nui or the Marae was there, then the Whale Pacifica was built, and that was also a tumultuous time. It's like, what? You know, when we started kind of seeing each other in competition for resources again, rather than making this a Pacific place. You know, but but always with the preface that we're here under the treaty. Need you know that always needs to go before a discussion can begin. I just want to thank you so much um, for everything that you've offered today um, and everything that you've brought. Um, when we saw each other for the first time at the fountain earlier, we had about two minutes where we just laughed, <laughs> um, and that same energy is everything that you've brought tonight. Um, in all of this reading. Um, so you really brought the alofa, the aroha, the aloha, um, the guaita tonight. And so I just want to say thank you. Sidhu, um, sumo
Um, I also want to thank the APA um, for hosting. Um, and the APA has been a really phenomenal advocate for not only Pacific, um, Pacific voices here at NYU, but also for indigenous voices. And so this is an interesting kind of moment that we're having right now to kind of continue this dialogue. Um, and so I just want to give thanks for, for this Friday, for this, for this house. Um, me too. Can I just understand that I just, I couldn't get over the, the, um, the slashes. Like what? What? D NYU doesn't have like a, you know, three separate schools. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, I wrote a poem about the slashes. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, thank you, Amita, for all your work mm -hmm. and Dean for the gorgeous invitation. Um, and for you all being here um, this afternoon and tonight as well, and for my gorgeous host, oh, thank you. more bison. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we have some um, some drinks and some food um, for y'all to enjoy and turn this conversation into a bit more intimate, if you like. Um, yeah, so thank you. And in the Lenape language, the word for thank you is wanishi. Wanishi. Wanishi, and it's um, it's actually like gratitude for our, all of our connections. Um, and not just our human ones, but also our connections to the land. So, wanishi.